law students shouting profanities and threats disrupt a free speech event with a bipartisan panel on civil liberties. For decades, a culture war has raged on college campuses about whether or not to deplatform contentious voices. The students that protested hurled insults at us, shouted us down. They were pounding on classroom walls. It was a terrifying night. Campus police issuing a shelter in place order after college Republicans invited Milo Yiannopoulos to speak. This is a police generator that was knocked over and set on fire when these protests turned into a riot. We will not tolerate racism or sexism or hate crimes and violence. He's a fascist and Berkeley did not welcome him. But lately, Something big and surprising has changed about this particular culture war. For the longest time, protests over free speech were pretty much confined to college campuses, until suddenly they exploded out of colleges and into workplaces, including newsrooms. It's a shift that some people pejoratively call the Great Awakening. People started sending me messages that they were going to attack me, that they were going to protest outside of my apartment. I watched the hate pour in and, you know, kind of to my shock, I I saw about half my colleagues retweet and promote this accusation. For years, I've been curious about the mechanics of how this happened. How did something that stayed on campuses for so long suddenly burst out into the world? This episode, I think, sheds light on one reason why it happened. So my name is Bessel van der Kolk. I'm a psychiatrist. The story starts far away from battles over free speech at a hospital for Vietnam veterans in Boston in the 1970s. Bessel was just beginning his career and he could see that something was terribly wrong with his patients, something mysterious that had no name. Take a former soldier turned lawyer named Tom. He himself goes to Vietnam, he becomes a platoon leader at age 18, and he goes into an ambush, and most of his men get killed, and he has these vivid images of these guys who he was in charge of getting killed. Bessel later wrote that the ambush happened during a foot patrol in a paddy field. Tom never saw the shooters. His men just started dropping around him, dead or terribly wounded. And later on he comes home, and it's the 5th of July, the day after Independence Day, I meet him, and he's a lawyer who has vomit all over his three-piece suit, and clearly he has been drinking by himself in his office over the weekend and he says i can't stand it anymore the firecrackers that go off on the fourth of july drive me crazy and i go back into the war and i'm no longer fit for human consumption basically bessel was one of the first people to give this condition a name post-traumatic stress disorder much to the teasing of his co-workers he says When I started off, my colleagues would say to me, ah, Bessel, you and your trauma, when you croak, nobody will talk about trauma again. Bessel says it had been this way since World War I, when soldiers with shell shock were disregarded by their superiors, who would say, This shell shock is just a fictitious disorder for cowards. The society was just blind. But he was undaunted. Plus, he thought, there was something surprising about the ways the symptoms manifested. I became fascinated with how trauma seemed to live on in the way they move, in the way they acted, in the way they seemed to have gotten stuck. It was as if their bodies were trapped in combat, unable to come home. Which is why they would startle easily, or become enraged, or numb, or they had chronic back pain, or migraines, or digestive problems. Soon, Bessel began seeing similar symptoms in other patients, people who hadn't seen combat. People came to see me because they were terribly depressed, or they assaulted their bodies, or they became terrified or anxious or couldn't sleep. And as you explore these symptoms, it looks like they were related to childhood trauma. 
Bessel's diagnosis that in many cases their trauma was a result of them being sexually abused as children was again met with consternation because back in the 70s it was assumed that only one in a million people were victims of incest. But Bessel was ahead of that orthodoxy, realising that it was much more common than that. And of course, as you note, not only is a person way more likely to be a victim of childhood sexual abuse than traumatised in war, but also if you're a victim of childhood sexual abuse, then the enemy combatants are likely to be members of your own family. That's correct. And so the number of trauma diagnoses began to expand. Thanks to Bessel and his colleagues, PTSD made it into the 1980 edition of the DSM, the Manual of Mental Disorders, listing as sufferers people who had experienced war, torture, rape, earthquakes, plane crashes. Later, it was broadened further to include firefighters, police, health workers, children diagnosed with cancer and their parents the public were becoming more awake to the condition than ever before. I think 9-11 made a big difference. People became aware of trauma. And of course, also the military industrial complex creates more and more people who go to war and who come back broken. In 2014, Bessel put all of his observations about PTSD into a book called The Body Keeps the Score. It was well reviewed by academics and steadily climbed the charts as the world began focusing on the traumatic stories emerging from the new Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, who spoke about intergenerational trauma, trauma transferred from parents to children. By 2017, the language of trauma was spreading into new places, including... Okay, so we cannot have our class if we have students interrupting the speaking. So This is Reed College, Portland, Oregon, in 2017. Three times a week for a year, the students disrupted the mandatory humanities class, protesting that it focused too heavily on texts written by dead white men. We believe that the first lesson that freshmen should learn about Hume 110 is that it perpetuates white supremacy by centering whiteness as the only required class at Reed. In most ways, this wasn't new. Students have for years protested against their reading lists being too white and male. But actually, there was something new about this protest. A group of students called Readies Against Racism, whose mission is to fight institutional racism as they see it at the college, had begun protesting in September of 2016. So it was a year of protests in the classroom during lectures. Uh, Students would occupy the lecture well and they would surround faculty holding signs condemning the course and the faculty against the course, against what we teach, against Plato and Aristotle, among other things, as being white supremacist texts. That's one of the targeted lecturers, Lucia Martinez Valdivia, telling the story on stage at Arizona State University a year later. Lucia teaches Sappho, an ancient Greek poet and lesbian icon. Sorry, Mr. Chancellor. This is an important part of your education about Hume 110. In the video I watched, the students snatched the microphone from in front of her and stood right next to her, talking loudly over her. Other students held up banners that read, Don't teach us white supremacy. Their tactics were startling and invasive, not least because of something they didn't know about Lucia. She has diagnosed PTSD. It certainly caused distress, I think, for any of us with previously existing trauma. It certainly aggravated it and activated it. It felt to me like a hostile work environment, having to go into that, knowing that that was there. And so it was extraordinarily stressful, I think, for increasing numbers of us as the year went on. Mm -hmm. Sleep loss, appetite loss, not being able to think. I came to dread going to work, and I love what I do. Lucia told the students about her PTSD diagnosis and asked them for the good of her health not to protest in her classroom. They responded with an open letter to Lucia, 
which said that they did respect her trauma, but some of them had trauma too, and, quote, saying that any form of protest would trigger your trauma not only ignores the traumas of students protesting, but creates a hierarchy where your traumas matter more. As somebody with PTSD who has been triggered in a real medical way as opposed to an I'm uncomfortable way, I take trauma very seriously. And for that reason, I'm very concerned by what is sometimes, to my mind, the trivialization of trauma. I think Lucia was railing against the idea that her medically diagnosed trauma was no more significant than the more conceptual trauma of being forced to read Plato. Had her lectures not been disrupted, she'd planned to tell the students, quote, don't write Plato off as a misogynist. Instead, try considering how it is that misogyny is a logical result, for him, of his reasoning. In the end, a compromise was reached something positive. The course widened to include more diverse voices, authors from Mexico and from the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. And then came 2020 and lockdown, and suddenly something happened to Bessel's book. Much to everybody's surprise, my book, The Body Keeps a Score, has become a runaway bestseller. Everybody seems to be reading about trauma these days through my book. Why has it become a massive bestseller? I don't know. It's very interesting to be somehow I hit the right note at the right time. Incredibly, for an academic book published six years earlier, The Body Keeps the Score became lockdown's biggest bestseller, shooting to the top of the New York Times list in May 2020 and staying at number one for 11 months in 2021. It's number one as I write this. The book's 147th week on the paperback nonfiction list. 147th. And if you know what this book is, that is wild. Your book is in enormous demand. It continues to top the bestseller charts. USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. That so many of us are turning to it. It says something profound about where the national psyche is in this moment of, yeah, trauma. Bessel says that many of his new readers were people with diagnosable PTSD, gaining insight into their condition. There's 68,000 reviews on Amazon right now, almost all five stars. They say, this book changed my life. It was a guide to get my life better. Others were surely people feeling traumatised by lockdown. Suddenly, millions of people were focusing on their traumas, diagnosable or not. This is the trauma test, okay? And I really need you to take a moment to consider this, okay? Are you hurting? The answer is yes, you have trauma. And don't you ever let someone tell you that you don't. the early 2020s, videos on TikTok tagged with the hashtag trauma had amassed 25 billion views. Although some PTSD sufferers were no doubt benefiting from this new awareness, for Bessel, it's a concept creep he doesn't appreciate. I deal with a very serious issue. This is not a frivolous enterprise, you know? The public now calls everything a trauma, including reading Othello in your high school class. No, that's not a trauma. Once you get gang raped, that might be the end of the world for you. Having your kid run over by a drunk driver, that's the end of the world. So it's very disrespectful to really traumatize people to call everything a trauma. As the world grew more focused on trauma, something else began to change on college campuses. Back in 2017, calls to protect students from emotional harm had tended to come from the students themselves in opposition to the administration. But no longer. My name is Samantha Jones. I'm a biology student at Syracuse University, but I'm also pre-law. The reason why I wanted to talk to you is because there was an incident at a social event, at a party. 
Yeah, so my roommate and a couple of my friends attended an off-campus Halloween party. It was fall of 2021. So I was at the party and a male student had arrived and he had a reputation for getting into fights and just kind of being inappropriate with other female students. The student was from Canada and there were rumors that he was on a sexual predator list there. And one of my female friends had been hit in the face by him while he was fighting with another male student. And this video kind of went viral throughout the school. So I think that's what added to the reputation that he had. I've seen the video. It shows the student in question. He is very sporty looking, dramatically punching his adversary. They fall to the floor and continue fighting while rolling around. Onlookers get caught in the crossfire, including Samantha's friend. She just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and ended up kind of catching one of the punches. So I just decided to speak with him in the hope that he would leave the party. I had just like a short five minute conversation with him, just letting him know that there were people that were uncomfortable with him. And then I asked if the rumors were true about him being on a Canadian sex offender registry. What did he say? He actually said nothing. Was this the first time you'd ever spoken to him? This was the first time I've ever spoken to him, yeah. So at that point, I realized that my efforts were kind of fruitless. So I just decided that if he wasn't going to leave, I could leave. So then we just walked home. All this was, I should say, not great behaviour on Samantha's part. She was standing up for her friend who'd been hit, but it was kind of invasive. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because of what happened next. Later that night, the student went to the school police office and claimed that I had physically assaulted, hit and kicked him. Additionally, he said that I broke his $900 cell phone and got other people to beat him up, which was just crazy. None of those things are true. The college convened a hearing panel. Samantha was called to testify. The accuser didn't show up. Finally, they announced their verdict. So the hearing panel rejected all of the physical assault charges just because there was no credible evidence to support them. But she was found guilty of something else. The board did find that I threatened the mental health of the student by confronting him. They were able to move forward with the harm of mental health just because of how vague and overbroad the statement of threatening mental health is. Do you think he was being sincere? Do you think he felt that his emotional health had been harmed by you? I truly believe that he was, for lack of a better word, playing the system. But the board disagreed. Quote, Accusing someone of something that has no validity, especially being on a sex offenders list, can harm one's mental health and safety. So what was your punishment? So my punishment included some workshops. I had to, on my own time, watch a TED Talk. It was essays, workshops, and watching videos. All of which amounted to a formal warning, quote, intended to clearly document in your disciplinary file that your behavior has been deemed unacceptable. Harming somebody's mental health, what exactly does that mean? This is Greg Germain, a professor of law at Syracuse, who helped Samantha through her disciplinary process. Something has changed drastically in the last, I don't know, five or six years. The whole atmosphere at the university is very different. I don't think we faculty were scared of our students like we are now. It's a very strange environment at the university these days. Tell me more about how professors have become scared of their students in the last few years. Well, students feel very comfortable going to the administration 
and complaining about their professors. Do you do things to protect yourself? I do. I record all my lectures. Greg gives me another example like Samantha's. How, in August 2022, a Syracuse student organised a bonding exercise, a kind of scavenger hunt. Kind of a goofy activity where they would take pictures of themselves doing goofy things, rolling down the steps of one of the buildings of the school, licking a statue, some nonsense like that, and none of the students were required to do it. It was just a completely voluntary, goofy thing. But one student filed a complaint. As a result, the organiser of the scavenger hunt was found guilty of causing emotional harm to her fellow students, not least with her suggestion that they each sit on a kissing bench and kiss another student on the mouth, an act that could result in, quote, emotional trauma or confusion. She was made to do community service. Plus, she had to watch the same TED talk that Samantha was forced to watch. What was the name of the TED Talk that they made you watch? It was Ruth Chang's How to Make Hard Decisions. I love that part of your punishment was being forced to watch TED Talks. Yeah, I've never had a TED Talk kind of weaponized like that against me. And so what began with students had shifted to administrations. I suppose because accusations of emotional harm were at once so serious sounding, but also so vague, colleges had no choice but to start treating them with gravity. And the same was true for when the language of trauma entered the world outside colleges, including newsrooms. My name is Lee Fong. I'm an investigative reporter. You might remember Lee from our episode about Antifa. Lee covered Antifa for the left-wing site The Intercept, but he fell out with some of his co-workers when he reported on sporadic violence in the days after George Floyd's murder. You know, I tweeted about cases of really absurd violence, and a number of my colleagues were very upset. It became a big fight internally. Lee means violence committed by left-wing and anarchist groups like Antifa. And in the midst of all of this, something very big happened to you. Well, in the midst of these protests in one town called San Leandro on the border of Oakland, you had five hours of sustained looting with no police presence because they had been sent to San Francisco and Oakland. Let's get right to live pictures of looting that is still going on. Here's CBS News in the middle of the chaos. Chopper 5 is over the Walmart store in San Leandro, where people have been running in and out of a side door with whatever they can carry out. An entire mall was ransacked, a Dodge dealership, a car dealership. 80 cars were taken off the lot. They were driven into stores. They were driven into other cars. Just mass vandalism and violence. Just a few moments ago, the city of San Leandro declared a curfew here in the city. Everyone is to go home until 5 a.m. because of what they described as roving bands of looters and rioters. I went there to interview people in the wake of that kind of orgy of violence. And as I was walking back to my car, a young man came up to me and said, are you with the media? I said, yes. He said, you know, there's something I want to get off my chest. He is a supporter of Black Lives Matter, but he sometimes struggles with some issues around the movement. The clip of Lee talking to the young man is quite long, but worth playing at length. So when I, as a black person, look at the Black Lives Matter movement, I have questions. Why does a black life matter only when a white man takes it? Because where I grew up at in East Oakland, there's been a lot of black people who killed by other black people. Why are we so tethered? with this white black. I I just don't get it. Like, if a white man takes my life, it's going to be national news. If a black man takes my life tonight, it might not even be spoken of. I've seen a lot of violence. I had two cousins that were murdered. They weren't murdered by a white man. They were murdered by a black man. That's black on black crime. And it could be devastating, just as devastating as what that white officer did to George Floyd. Because I'm sure his mother ain't going to get over that for a long time. It's subjects like that I want in the mix. I just want it to evolve. I want it to grow. Here I am now talking to you. I'm just 
putting my two cents in. Just see if I can make it grow and make it expand. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, yeah. What was your name again? Max. Max. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah. I remember driving back with my colleague Leighton and we were like, well, that, that was so interesting. Way more interesting than most of my interviews that day. Lee posted the interview on Twitter with the comment, Max from Oakland, a supporter of BLM, has a measured critique he wanted to share. Almost immediately, a colleague of mine said that this interview was me attempting to promote another racial trope. The tweet from Lee's colleague read, Tired of being made to deal with my co-worker at LH Fong, continuing to push narratives about black-on-black crime after repeatedly being asked not to. Lee denies that any editor had ever said that to him, and an Intercept spokesperson told us, quote, As I'm sure you can understand, we cannot comment on personnel matters. That tweet went super viral. It became trending nationally. People started sending me messages that they were going to attack me, that they were going to protest outside of my apartment. It was a very destabilizing experience. I kind of didn't sleep for the next two days. I watched the hate pour in and, you know, kind of to my shock, I I saw about half my colleagues retweet and promote this accusation. To have my own colleagues go after me in such a way, I, I was blown away by that and really just I felt very alienated from my own workplace after it happened. It wasn't only Lee's colleagues. Many journalists got involved, including a Washington Post reporter who tweeted that Lee's anti-blackness had been glaringly evident for years. For Lee, this was a culture war between journalists who cared too much about ideology versus him who cared about evidence. But ideology can take many forms, including which stories a person chooses to tell. Still, one thing's for sure. Newsrooms were dealing with conflicts like this differently once the language of trauma swept through the working world. So I was sent to intercept human resources, the HR department, And they had hired a therapist, an actual therapist, to talk to the person who accused me of racism and to talk to me because of all the harm I created in the workplace with my interview. A lot of the tweets similarly use this kind of therapeutic language to discuss all the harm I caused, the trauma I caused. So you issued an apology? Well, I hadn't slept for two days, and I was at my wit's end because I thought I was going to lose my job. I felt like I was in self-preservation mode, and I typed up an apology. How would you feel about reading out your apology? Yeah, let me look at it again, think about it real quick, and I'll give you a snap decision. Let me just scan it again. I just kind of avoided even looking at it over the last couple of years just because I kind of cringe. Uh, I think I'm okay. I just, I don't know. I hate reading this. This makes me so upset. (laughs) Okay. In that case, I I want to spare you that. Sorry, I don't don't mean to be difficult. And so, with Lee's blessing, I'll read out some of the apology instead. Quote, I recently had a conflict with a colleague whose feelings I harmed. I hate that even in the smallest way I may have contributed to a toxic discourse that causes pain to anyone. But even more than that, I am saddened that my words caused harm to colleagues and to many people whom I care deeply about. I wrote this apology. As soon as I posted that, my apology was posted on some of the right-wing message boards and alt-right people started flooding me with racist memes, people in dunce hats being forced to write fake confessions to please the communist mob. That also cut deep because my family had been tortured and really traumatized by the Cultural Revolution in China. My grandfather was denounced and my father sent to a work camp. God, so in the course of 24 hours, you annoyed everyone. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. 
how do you feel about the apology now? It's a little bit silly and embarrassing in retrospect to issue a literal apology for simply interviewing a young man who had genuine feelings. The more time I have away from this mini semi-cancellation, whatever you want to call it, I see it through a class lens. You know, I believe that America is a class-based society that pretends to be an identity-based society, and I think that's true for other countries as well. You know, Max, he reached out to me after the tweet went viral and, you know, I was accused of racism, and he was livid because he said, you were one of the only people to give me a voice. This is absurd. And I started to talk to him. He was working on a ferry. He had been laid off. He'd been without a job for a very long time. He's a working class guy. You know, the principles of wokeness are supposedly about lifting up marginalized voices. His voice is certainly marginalized in this debate. And the people who were shouting him down, the people who were calling me racist for interviewing him, were people who went to prep schools, who grew up in incredibly wealthy families, who, who worked at elite prestige media outlets. And the more I think about this, it just kind of grinds my gears. It seems like by issuing an apology, I was giving in to the very powerful against someone who was just trying to speak out. And so, you know, for that reason in particular, I regret issuing an apology. I've long been curious about the mechanics of how the culture war over free speech burst out of colleges and into the workplace. I think the language of trauma has a lot to do with it. It's easier to silence a controversial voice amid accusations that that person is causing emotional harm. A new awareness of trauma has had many very positive consequences. But when trauma is weaponized in the culture war, the victim can be nuance and curiosity and debate. Things Fell Apart was written and presented by me, John Ronson, and produced by Sarah Shebia. The music was composed by Phil Channel. The programme was mixed by Giles Aspen, the editor.